Good evening. Welcome to Big Hill Christian Church, where we're doing our Going Deeper study, our Sunday evening study. We, if you're on Facebook, we're glad that you're with us. I uh, want to, again, as we always do, remind you if you have any prayer requests or comments, questions you'd like to send to us, go, please go ahead and do that. We'll try to address those at the end of the service. Um, this evening. Uh, basically built on what we started this morning. Uh, the, the title of the, of the message this morning was Out with the Old and In with the New. As we come to a new year and we, we look towards changing some things in our lives and recognizing the needs that we have to be better people or striving to be better people, we, uh, we try to do some things to make that happen. And so this morning we talked about the need rather than try to do what we can do with our lives just submit our will to the lord's will our lives into his hands and have christ in us lead us in the way that the lord would have us go with that in mind i've chosen one of the scriptures that we use is second corinthians five seventeen and 19 kind of to base our study this evening but i got a couple like a case study and then another verse i'd like for us to to consider but before we get into that, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer, then we'll, then we'll dive in here. Father, we thank you, as always, to, uh, to bring us together, or for bringing us together, to study your word, to, to go deep into the scriptures. Father, I pray this evening, just as this morning, that, that we open ourselves up to you, and we allow you to, to come into our lives and remove whatever obstacles there are that keep us from being closer to you. So, Father, as we open our Bibles again this evening and uh, begin to study, we pray that you'll make your presence known to us, that you'll speak to us, pierce our hearts, convict us, help us, Father, to see the need that we have in our lives. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So let's look at, uh, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Looking at verses 17 through 19. I'd like to read that, and then if, if you have a handout, you can see we've got this chopped up into different sections. Uh, if you're with us on Facebook, that should be on our Facebook page. So uh, let's, let's read this and, and talk a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So I think there's probably, I don't know, eight or so questions here. Looking at this verse, realizing the need for us to try to be better people, looking at where we are in our lives, could we truthfully say right now that we are in Christ? And if so, how do you know? Now this, to, to me, this is kind of ground zero. But when, we, when we read this verse, it says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. That's a wonderful thing. Are we in Christ? How do, we, how do we know that we are, and how, what do we need to do if we're not? You know, you can, you can watch TV evangelists. You can, you can read books, and some of them will say, well, all you have to do is say a prayer, and Christ will come into your life. All you have to do is walk down an aisle, sign a card, do, do yeah, read your Bible. That, that just, Christ is, is in you. But the thing I want you to consider, if we say we're in Christ, how do you know you are? some of these things that go on in this, in this, in this verse. It says, if, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Are you different than you were? Is there something new about you, even, even to the point that you could say you're, you're a completely different being than you were before because Christ is in you? Or have we said, well, I'm in Christ, but there's no change. There's no difference. People around you don't notice anything different about you. Inside of you, you're still doing the same things. You just maybe have a different facade or a different uh, 
way of describing yourself. You know, the studies today tell us that something like 60% of people in the world today will identify themselves as evangelical Christians, but only there's only something like 17% of them can describe the term. We say we're, we're Christians, we're in Christ, but we can't describe what that is. We don't know what that feels like. We don't know how to describe it because maybe it's really not there. We just want it to be. He goes on. If, we, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. To me, this is probably one of the hardest things that we can say. What have we added to our lives, taken away from our lives, removed from our lives that were the old us that is no longer us? You know, a minute ago we said, well, how do you know you're in Christ? And we say different things. Well, Kenny raised his Bible up. We read our Bible. Well, didn't we read our Bible before? What's different now? If the old things have passed away, does that mean that that we have given up our Bible? Or does that mean we're actually beginning to now read our Bible? That Bible that we carried and we said we believed in, that that we lived by, do we now recognize the fact that we really do dig into this and study this and live by this and go to it for answers? Or are we just holding on to it like we, do, like we always have done before? It's there. It's not part of our lives, but it's there. If, if, if we're a new creature in Christ, I think, I think we just, we have this picture of, okay, now I'm completely different. I don't think evil thoughts. I don't do evil things. I've just let the Lord come into my life, and he has made this change in me that just has made me perfect, except I'm not. And I wonder, does that mean I'm not in Christ does that mean I'm not living up to the standard I'm supposed to does that mean I failed again and I think what what you're saying is yeah I read my Bible I I, I read it every day because I've got one of these little charts that I have to check off every day so I can read my Bible through in a year so yeah I've read my Bible can't tell you what it says can't tell you any application to my life that I've taken from it but I read it every day Is that being a new creature? And if it is with Christ at the center of our lives, should that be a fair statement that we can make? Or should we say, I think what you're saying, I feel bad that I don't. And I ask the Lord to help me with it. To me, that's an indication that we are new creatures in Christ. you remember a time when you didn't read your Bible, it didn't bother you? you know, can you remember where not going to church wasn't that big a deal? I'd go if I could, and if it, something better came along, I, I wouldn't. Now it bothers us that we're not part of the body of Christ like we're called to be because we've read this in his word. Do we slip with our tongues sometime and say things we shouldn't say, do things we shouldn't do? And now it begins to bother us where before it didn't. That's an indication that we're striving to be that person. And, and I think I don't want to play this down too much, but at the same time, I think the, the, the beginning of a life in Christ is not going to be just a 100% committed, perfect lifestyle. It's a gradual, ongoing thing. And you see that in Scripture over and over and over. We've been given talents and abilities according to our level of faith. Well, maybe our level of faith to begin with is not where we want it to be, but we see the need to strive for that. And so as we, as we begin to take on this new creature role, 
we begin to see the things that appeal to us that didn't before and the things that cause us to walk away that we didn't before we begin to see that change take place and as we as we grow in that we become more rooted and deeper in the word as well just like it goes on and says here the old things have passed away new things have come in verse 18 it says now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation now, this morning I said you know reconciliation that's one of those church words to be reconciled is to be brought back into a proper relationship do you think can you say that we have been reconciled to Christ to God through Christ or is that again is that a, a gradual process what do you think yeah yeah that barrier is no longer there There you go. Yeah, it's, it's like the passage that we read and we hold on to, and I think often we take it out of context. Nothing separates us from the love of God. That means I can do whatever I want to do. Like Paul was saying, you know, shall we continue to sin so grace could abound? No, 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 no. May it never be that way. But we say, well, God is a loving God, and nothing separates us from God's love. So whatever I do, he forgives automatically, and he loves me unconditionally. It says so. And, and you know, it, I'm... I'm good to go. I don't think that's what he means here. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. That crimson's turned to snow. That that that, that red has turned to, to wool. I mean, we've we, we've we've made that transition, not because we've done it, but because, like Kenny said, that the the veil of the temple was torn, the barrier is gone. It's it's it, you know, like it says right here, he he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It's a gift. He he's offering us to be reconciled to himself through. Christ so when this says the, the question I think it's the one two three the, f the fifth bullet down there are we reconciled to God consider this if you say yes how are you reconciled through Christ the only way to the father is through the son and for us to say well yeah I've heard people say well you know I don't go to church God and I have this agreement that's dangerous ground. I mean, that's, that's, that's scary. Because you're saying there's another way to the Lord except through obedience and through Jesus Christ. God doesn't have a special agreement with you. He has a special agreement with all of us. And for us to think that we can change that or amend that or add to that, we're, we're badly mistaken and deceived by the devil if we think that we could, we're actually in that position. So the last two questions, do, do we recognize the need to be in Christ? Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, without him we have no hope. That's that's exactly right. And if we, if if you look at kind of summarizing the the verse here, if we have not become a new creation, if we can't tell a difference in our life, if if we don't 
if we don't feel that reconciliation between us and the Lord anymore, then something is wrong on our part, not the Lord's part. And I, and I think that we oftentimes are, are deceived by the devil into thinking that we're all okay. And, and what I'd like to do here, that, that how do we know, last bullet on that one, I'd like you to hold on to that. And let's go on to Acts chapter 9. And in Acts chapter 9, the first 19 verses is the account of, of Saul, Paul, his conversion on the, on the road to Damascus. So, if you will, take your, take your Bibles and, and let's, let's go to Acts chapter 9. And I want to read the account and then, then go back and, and let's, look at, let's look at a couple questions. It says, now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a, <clears throat> a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. Now, you might be thinking, what does this have to do with what you're talking about? In this study, do you think that Saul saw a need for a fresh start in his life. He was a Pharisee, Hebrew of Hebrews. He was, he was part of a, a, a strict sect of religious people in Jerusalem that were known for their piety, for their, their adherence to the over 600 laws that they had created in the Torah. Saul was looked up to by the public. He was, he, was, he was a religious elitist. If you would have asked him, Saul, how is your relationship with God? He would have quoted out of Philippians to you. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, born of the tribe of Benjamin. I've done all the right things. I've studied all the right books. I know all the answers to all the questions. I'm, I'm as good as it gets, and I've got a future in the church. That's in Ephesians, I think it's 3, verses 5 and 6. But if you read verse 7, after this account, he says, but all that's worthless now. All that pales in comparison to my relationship with Jesus Christ. So here, before the Lord struck him to his knees on the Damascus road, if you had asked Saul, do you need to be closer to the Lord? Do you, do you see a need to be a new creation in Christ? He'd have laughed at you. 
Yeah, he'd have first he'd have taken your name and took you to Jerusalem. That's right. He, he'd, he'd have took you to the courts. Is it possible that we can be fooled in the same way? I mean, do, do you think that, that, it, that it's possible that just because I've decided to start reading my Bible or attending church, that now I'm that new creation in Christ? If I move from the back row to the front row, does that, does that improve my standing of the, in my relationship to the Lord? If I start giving a little more money, if I start doing a few more things, is that, is that all that's involved in that new creation? I mean, if you ask, Paul, if you ask Saul here, so I did. Yeah. Yeah, if, if we think it's all about us, yeah, that's a red flag. We, 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 there's, there's problems there. It's not about us. And, and I think a good example of that, your next bullet down there, do you think Ananias was asking for that kind of a call from God? You know, it, it, it described him. It says, <clears throat> Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. He was one of God's people. He was a disciple. He was following the Lord. Things were going along pretty good, evidently. If it says that there was a disciple, that, that means that he was known as a follower of God. But when the Lord speaks and says, I got a job for you, I want you to go over to Judas's house. He lives on Straight Street. And there's a guy there named Saul. He's from Tarsus. And I want you to lay hands on him so he'll get his sight back. And like Mark had said earlier, if he knows I'm a disciple, he's going to take my name. He's going to take me to Jerusalem. And that's, that's what he says to the Lord. He answers the Lord by saying, I, I've heard a lot of things about this guy. And he's done a lot of harm to the church. Do you think that that was news to the Lord? I mean, do you think that God's going to look at man and I say, oh, it's him. I forgot. I didn't realize it was him. Never mind. No, he said, I've, I've got a job for you. This, this is what I want you to do. He's going to be well used. He's going to be an instrument of mine, and he needs to see. So you go to him, lay your hands on him, and he'll regain his sight. And he's probably thinking, well, the first thing he's going to see is that I'm a disciple of Christ, and I'm done. But let's back up just a little bit. It says that when, when Saul was struck by the, that light from the Lord and that conversation took place, he had to be physically led to Judas's house. And he did not eat. He did not drink. He did not see for three days. Now, let's, let's put in perspective do you think that those three days played in Saul's conversion yeah yeah, yeah. something's got to flip your switch yeah, it, 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 I think it was, it was either like Henry Ford or J.P. Morgan. One of those guys said, the first step in change is realizing where you are. And, and I think for Saul to have this uppity opinion of himself, to be knocked to his knees the way he was, and to be in a strange place that he couldn't even see to anxious, scared, concerned, whatever. He couldn't eat. He couldn't drink. He was so taken by what had happened, it changed him. Yeah. Yeah. And, 
and, and what, what I want us to see here is when we make this transition from the old to the new, what's involved in that process? Change of heart. I mean, Saul is in this guy's house replaying that conversation with the Lord. And the last words he heard were, get up and enter the city and it will be told you what you must do. Think with me. Is that any different than the calling that God has placed on us? Could we be so anxious, so concerned, so thrilled, whatever you, whatever emotion you want to put into how you would feel about going from that old sinful self to a new creation in Christ without you, your heart being broken, your will demolished, a total surrender of self to the Lord. What, what is involved in that for us? For Saul, it was three days of just soul searching. And I think that's putting it lightly. He, he came to the realization that all that he thought he was is nothing. That's not what God had called for him to be. He's saying, you take that old self and push it away. You're going to be an instrument of mine. The very God that you are persecuting is the God that you will serve for the rest of your life with total abandon. Yeah. Yeah, see the Pharisees, they didn't see that. I'm not persecuting you. I'm keeping the law. You know, I, I'm, I'm perfect in the law. I have, I have kept the law. But then Jesus, once he, once he knows who Jesus is, he realizes the law is not fulfilled until Jesus came to do that. The old law that he's studying has been, has been fulfilled. The Messiah has come, and he didn't recognize that. They didn't, they didn't hold to the gospel. They were holding to the Torah. So what, what is it we have to let go of? What is it that we have, where we have been thinking well about ourselves, all of a sudden when we come to the realization, just like we saw here, when the Lord says to us, why are you persecuting my church? Why are you not living the life I've called you to live? Does it shake the foundation of our, of, our, of our souls? I think it has to in order to change us to what we're supposed to be. Some of, the, some of the old commentaries draw the parallel of Christ being in the tomb three days, resurrected. Saul was three days blind, reborn. There's, there's, there's that transition that has to take place that God can only do in our lives. And for us to think that we can do it, read a book. You know, five easy steps to being a complete Christian or whatever. You know, try to find somebody's idea of what it looks like. I don't think that happens that way. I think, I think it comes from a total search, like Scripture says. We have to search for the Lord with all our hearts. And I wonder, do we? He said, you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I wonder what kind of effort we've given it. You know, can, we, can we truly say that, yeah, I can identify with Saul's suffering here. I know 
I know what Saul's going through. Can we say that? And I think it, it's, it's just as important that we see Ananias' role in here. Can we see ourselves as Ananias? When God calls us to do something, I mean, compare Ananias with Abraham. The Lord told Abraham, I've got a job for you. Pack up and move. And when you get there, I'll let you know. Abraham didn't say, well, Lord, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd really like to know where it is we're going. Or, you know, should I, should I pack winter clothes or summer clothes? Or, you know, do I you know, do we make reservations along the way? How, how am I going to know? what it is you want me to do he just it just says the Lord said go and says and Abraham went Ananias Lord I you know, I'm, I'm flattered that you, you you call me but do you know who this guy is and and my favorite one of the one of the conversions one of the healings uh, I think it's in John <clears throat> there was a man at a pool in Bethesda and he was crippled. And he, and he tried to get to the water every time. And there was a spirit that moved in the water, and the first one in was healed. And he was always second at best. He never was able to make it. When he was confronted, the question was asked him, do you want to be well? What do you think? But that's always haunted me. You know, when, when we say, Lord, I want to, I want to be all in. I, I want to be a living sacrifice. I want to be obedient to death. I want to, I want to be like Paul. You can almost hear the Lord saying, you really want to be well? You see, this guy at Bethesda, I think he had come, he had become accustomed to not being well he had learned to live with the, with the problem that he had and I wonder if Satan isn't fooling us but in the same way by saying you know you, you really don't need that you're okay God's not going to God's not going to give you more than you can handle and if you're truly blessed and if you're truly one of his you're not going to have any trouble at all because he's going to watch out for you he's going to protect you he's going to keep all this stuff from happening to you but the Lord himself says they'll hate you because they hated me first. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have difficulties. But don't look at the difficulties. Look at the reward for the life that you lived. Look at the opportunity that you have to stand for me. And I wonder if we, if when we begin to weigh those things, if we don't kind of see what Paul, Saul, is going through here. Don't you think that the thought came to him, am I wrong? Is, is this way that these people are, are, are following, is, is that really where I need to be? I put everything in my life into, into the traditional pharisaical law. I've, I'm fast-tracking to, 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 to go up the ladder. Is all that wrong? And when we look at our life, when we look at our core theology, when we look at our doctrine that, that we're living by, and we see the Lord call on our lives, do we question that? You know, Ananias, if the Lord says, go to Saul, why do I question? Don't, hasn't he told me that he'll never leave me, he'll never desert me? Don't, don't I know that he wouldn't call me to do something he's not equipping me to do? But when that knocks us out of our comfort zone, these questions start coming. Where do these questions come from? Satan. Just like Eve. Did he really say? Yeah. 
You know, I, I read something the other day, and I think, I think it's lined up to be in, in the devotional thing for tomorrow. When, when we have a problem, we, we have no problem with praying to God about it. Lord, I need help. Lord, I, I need you to, to do this and to do that. Do we have the same amount of thought in praising God for the prayers he's already answered for us? I mean, if you, if you draw a line down a piece of paper and you begin to list the times you've prayed for help, how does that compare to the prayers that you've given in praise for God for who he is and what he's already done? Is that an equal, is it an equal list? And if we're a new creation in Christ, don't we look to God first for the things he's already done in our lives and the things that we're already blessed with and the, the knowledge, the, the assurance, the peace that we have in facing the difficulties that we are facing and knowing that God is already at work in those situations for our good because we are dedicated to him. And I think that goes back to that, are we holding on to the old or have we let it go and are we a new creature in Christ? Do we, do we put God at the center of everything that we do or do we just run to him when we have a need for him? And we're calling that a new relationship. So, we, we know what happens to Saul. He becomes Paul, and we know, I mean, read the New Testament. You want to see, you want to see Paul. What about Ananias? He, he didn't argue. He, he just kind of clarified. <laughs> sure. But he does this. And, and, and the thing that I think is, is encouraging, when he goes to Saul, he doesn't try to stay away from him. He, he says he, he, he lays hands on him and he calls him Brother Saul. Brother Saul, the Lord has sent me to you. And, Paul, and Saul is saying, I know. I've seen you in visions. You, you are that messenger from God that's sent to do what he has called you to do. So when Ananias hears that the Lord is saying that this, this Saul is seeing you in a vision come to him, when he goes to Saul and Saul confirms that, what do you think that does to Ananias? Just, just like we read where if, if we have turned our lives into living sacrifices for the Lord and he sends us out to do things so that we can see his will play out in our lives when we, when we read these commands then we actually begin to live these commands and then we see the follow up with the Lord showing us his will in our lives that's the confirmation that keeps us going so I'm sure you really you probably think my next question is, how often do we see that play out in our lives? I'd say we see that play out in our lives as often as we do that in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. But I, th I think, you know, not but, and. I, th I think the thing that we will see in our lives is we don't dread those situations coming. We actually begin to look for them. You know, it, it, it's not a, oh, no, not another. It's, hey, here's another opportunity. You know, how often do we see the Lord himself has placed this in my path so I can see his blessing on my life? Or do we go, oh, gosh, another problem. You know, the old us sees the problem. Those the new us see the Lord in the answer. Go with me to 
let's go to Colossians. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. I think this will help us. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Look at verse 6. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. What's that look like? obedience we've all been given talents and abilities according to our faith so what this is saying the way I read this is according to your belief live it what what you know to be truth live that what, what you know to be God's call on your life what you know to be God's direction for you what you know for the, from the Holy Spirit teaching and guiding you, live that. Don't set it off to the side. Don't, don't put it off for another time. Live it. By faith, step out. And, and just like you have received the Lord, follow him. Now, when, when Saul was confronted on the Damascus Road. He had that three-day crash course in Christianity, if you will. And what did he do immediately after that? He started preaching Christ. Can, can you imagine what the people in Damascus or wherever he started, what they thought when, when Saul of Tarsus begins to praise the gospel, give the gospel message and praise the name of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine what that would have been? I bet it was on the 6 o'clock news all over the world. Saul has lost it. You know, where's his standing with the Pharisees now? I mean, when God when, when the Lord called Saul out, think of the repercussions. He was no longer one of the Pharisees. But he was, never, he was not yet really accepted by the Christians. It was him and the Lord. That was it. And the Lord was sending him places and he began to go into different places and teach. And a group before him would come in and say, this guy's coming. He's telling, he's, he's preaching heresy. And they would follow up behind him and say, see, he was, he's not who we think he is. Let's stone him. Let's, let's kill him. Let's imprison him. You know, what, what, what it said here in, in Acts, he must know how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Does that sound like a fun lifestyle? No. But that's what Saul was called to. And as he goes through shipwrecks, stonings, imprisonment, all of these things, he says to live is Christ, to die is gain. I want to live a life to where I know nothing but Christ and him crucified. Wow. Wow. Is that our new life? You think that's what we're called to? I do. I do. So, just as you have received Christ, walk in him. <coughs> then in 7 it says, Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. What's that life look like? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> how, how firmly rooted are we? How built up are we? How established 
is our faith. If we're that new creation, it's going to be different than it was. And again, I think, it, I think it's a growing, maturing process. I don't think we just all of a sudden, boom, we're Moses. But I think we gain. You know, Paul says, be like me as I try to be like Christ. And Paul says often, not that I'm there yet. I'm chief among sinners. I'm, I'm the least of the apostles. And we look at Paul thinking, wow, Paul. But Paul's opinion of himself was a bondservant of Christ, not a prince, not a viceroy, not somebody in a, in a, in a hierarchy position like he was with the Pharisees. No, no, no. He's the guy that would wash your feet. You know, he, he's the guy that was the, the, the manual laborer, menial servant. That's how he saw himself. But he said that's the best life. Verse 8. After we've been firmly rooted, after we've begun to live the life that, we, that we've been called to, after we begin to put everything into place, it says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. We don't have any of that around here, do we? Would somebody actually teach false doctrine in the church? Is it, is it, is it possible that, that we can be deceived if we are firmly grounded and rooted in God's Word? Can we be fooled? Absolutely. Ab absolutely. How does that happen? It appeals to us. There's a, there, there's a desire for the easy way to go. There's, a, there's a, 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 an instinct in us that is just a tad rebellious. It's a sinful nature that we were born with. If there's an easier way to do something, will we look for it? Yeah. Should we? No. I mean, go back to Adam and Eve. He told us not to touch that. Ah, he didn't mean that. He specifically said, I'll give you the whole garden. Just don't go to that tree. You've got a thousand other trees. What was so special about that one? It's forbidden. Yeah. 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 He, he didn't say God lied. He said, well, he didn't really mean that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what, we'll, what we'll do traditionally, we'll say, you know, maybe, maybe like what Dave's saying, this has been like a wake up call. I really, I really, I see this now. How long will that last? Yeah, and I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying that, that, that's, that's human nature. You know, that, that's exactly right. Yeah, I, th there was a time when I was, <clears throat> Kenny, Kenny will remember this. When I first started coming to, to, to Big Hill, came back to, to Big Hill, and was looking, the Lord was working in my life. We went to a Promise Keeper convention. And, and, and I, was, I was told by my wife, you just go and listen for the Lord to speak. And I hadn't been in that building 10 seconds. And I heard the Lord speak to me. And I mean, it dropped me to my knees. And I thought, my life will never be the same. But I still slip. I still fall. I still wish I had that, 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 that feeling that night in my life. You know, I spent a long time trying to get that back. And I found out it's, it's, that's not what you do each day. You serve, and you'll have those emotional highs and those emotional lows, but all through it, you have that calm, sincere, serene peace that passes understanding that goes with you. 
just, just like Paul on the Damascus Road. I think we all have had that eye-opening wake-up call encounter with the Lord. The thing is, what do we do with it? We can find somebody here, like here in verse 8. They'll say, well, you know what that is? That, that's your call to back my ministry. That's your call to, to, to serve in this way. But, but it's an empty package. And we're to test everything that comes down our way against Scripture. And to ask ourselves, is that of God or is that of the world? And when we do that and we ask the Lord to reveal that to us, he says he will reveal that to us. And then we live that. And it may mean a hard call. It may mean a difficult time for our lives. But the reward overweighs the anxiety and the challenge that we face. So just like it concludes here in verse 8, see to it no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. I think this brings us all the way back to the old creation versus the new creation. When we can come to the point to where that empty philosophy, that, that, that false doctrine, when that has no appeal to us anymore, we begin to see that growth take place and we begin to establish our faith. We, we, we begin to walk that relationship with the Lord because we want that more than we want the easy way out. So, That concludes that. Any any questions? Comments? Yeah. Yeah. As we come to a new year, <clears throat> that's kind of like what I was talking about this morning. De De December 31st at 11.58 p.m. is not going to be any different on this planet than January the 1st at, at 1.30 a.m. The world's going to continue to be the world. And for us to wait on something to happen outside of ourselves to change our lives is going to be a long wait. The change comes with Christ in us. By surrendering our will and accepting Jesus Christ, that's how we see that change take place in us. It's not going to be something that happens in the world. It's going to be something supernaturally that happens outside. Something that happens inside us. So, my... Uh, my challenge is let's don't limit ourselves to what we can do to make ourselves better. Let's surrender ourselves and let the Lord change us. Okay. Uh, any, any prayer requests from anybody? Okay, I've got, I've got a couple here. Um, we've got one call this afternoon. If you will, keep Katie Spaulding in your prayers. That's Fran's niece. Uh, she has covid also, Dan Gilbert's brother's mother-in-law has COVID. She's 86 years old and in a North Carolina hospital. Also, Dan's brother, Kenny, has had a portion of his foot and his big toe amputated due to complications from diabetes. Keep Junior Collins in our prayers. Um, and then Tony Dotson, uh, this morning his niece, uh, asked for prayer. She has COVID. And then Brooklyn... Brooklyn White has a torn meniscus and is going to go to the doctor this week. Also keep uh, a lot of folks that weren't here this morning that are traveling, visiting family, keep, keep them in our prayers. I know uh, coming in from Lexington this morning, I saw a couple cars they still haven't picked up from, from a couple days ago, wrecks that had happened. There's a lot of people involved in accidents, and a lot of folks on the road, so, so keep them in our prayers. Anybody else?
Okay. Right. Okay, so Jimmy Shank's dad with cancer and the grandbaby is going to Cincinnati for heart surgery. Heart cath, okay. Any others? Okay, well, let's, uh, let's take a moment or two, silent prayer, and then I'll, I'll close. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that you do, for all that you are. Lord, your word this evening, uh, as it speaks to us, I, I pray that we, we do search for you with all our heart, knowing that when we do, we'll find you. And when we do, we begin a new life. The old is gone, the new has come. Help us, Father, to, to continually grow in you, having Christ in us, the Holy Spirit, to to teach and to guide and to direct. Father, help us to realize that we, we, we need to do this not just for ourselves, but for those that we know and that we love. They need to know you also. So, Father, plant that seed inside of us. Give us that challenge. Help us to, uh, to, to, to change and to be what you would have us to be, just dying to ourself and submitting, surrendering to your will for us. Thank you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us. And just a reminder, we will not be having our Wednesday evening adult Bible study. Hope to see you all soon. Thanks.